Welcome everyone to the Association for Literary Urban Studies 2022 conference on the theme of cities under stress. This is session 1B, Divided Cities. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers of this conference who have done an amazing amount of work. Ani Lapala and Liam Lanigan are in the room. Eric Prieto uh, is also one of the organizers of this conference and they've just done, we were just talking about how much email academics do and I can't imagine how many hundreds of emails y'all have sent to make this happen. And it's so exciting to be in conversation with everyone. So thank you for all of that labor. Uh, my name is Davy Niddle. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in architecture at Princeton University, and I'm speaking to you today from Philadelphia, which is the unceded land of the Lenape people. I will introduce our panelists in just a moment. Each panelist will speak for about 20 minutes, which will be followed by discussion. Uh, please feel free to put questions in the chat at any time and to contribute questions through the chat or by raising your hand and speaking your question during the Q&A. So our panelists today are Hannah Grayson, who is a lecturer in French and Francophone studies at the University of Sterling. Her research focuses on crisis and its aftermath in Francophone African literature. And her current book, book project on Tierno Mononembo investigates his fictional depictions of De Boyardis. She has also worked extensively on the testimonies of people who lived through the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. She will be spending the spring completing a fellowship at the Library of Congress. Congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, for work toward a monograph on the work of Tierna Monanembo. Our second panelist will be Lisa Goff, who is an Associate Professor of English and American Studies at the University of Virginia and Director of UVA's Institute for Public History. She's the author of Shantytown USA, Forgotten Landscapes of the Working Poor, Harvard University Press 2016, and the Project Director for Take Back the Archive, a digital history project dedicated to the history of sexual violence at UVA. Our third presenter, who we hope will be able to join us, is Olajide Salawu, who is a PhD student at the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. Uh, thanks again, everyone, so much for being here, and I will now turn things over to him. Thanks so much, Davey. I'm going to share my screen. And trust that is working. Yeah, you have my greetings from Scotland. Good afternoon from here. Good morning, if that's more applicable to where you are. Um, I'm going to begin with a quotation and a content warning because it contains a violent image. A reign of terror had taken hold of the city, with the infamous death squads roaming the streets after curfew. Army officials encouraging citizens to report suspicious activity to telephone hotlines and the destruction of poor neighborhoods and slums. Northerners in popular neighborhoods were subjected to regular roundups in which they were stripped to the waist, relieved of their documents and carted off in trucks like cattle. It was not uncommon to drive by a naked corpse on the side of the road in the early morning, hands tied behind the bed and a bullet in the back of the head. Describing Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire, Ruth Marshall Fratani writes of the escalation of events she observed in horror as an eyewitness in 2002. A nine-year conflict saw the southern-led government of the Ivory Coast fight groups traditionally hailing from the north. That year, then-President Lauren Bagbo had launched the Operation Nationale d'Identification, or National Identifying Operation, instructing all Ivoirians to return to their village of origin in order to be registered there as citizens. All persons who could not claim a village of origin within the country were to be considered as immigrants and would therefore lose their citizenship. This was but the latest step in years of conflict and obsession around the category of autochthony that split the nation in two. This term, which means being of the soil, has been used as a basis for ivoirité in Côte d'Ivoire and elsewhere. Ideologically, autochthony makes citizenship status subject to being at home or belonging in the soil or in the national space. The turn towards the city comes in part from Patrice Ganang's manifest Manifesto for New African Literature, in which he sets out what he sees as the defining terms of contemporary African literature. His primary reference point in that manifesto for authentic experience of the precarious cycle of life in 21st century Africa is la rue or the street. And the apparent paradox that he and others seek to untangle is that city space being both what he calls the churning seat of detritus and at the same time, an infinite space of possibilities birthed from disorder. Following Liddy Mudeleno, who has argued for African literature as a unique locus for catching glimpses of the considerable complexity of that place, 
This paper takes two 21st century Ivoirian novels as a way into and hopefully beyond looking at resilience in the city. Amadou Karouma's novel, Quand on refuse en dit non, which translates as when you refuse you say no, follows two characters fleeing the violence of civil war. Published in 2004, so only two years after the beginning of that civil war, there is a marked intensity to the country's unraveling political situation and the disdain directed at it in the novel through parody. Published the following year, Matin du Couvre-feu, or Mornings of Curfew, by exiled Tana Laboni, plunges the reader into the heart of that violence in a similarly satirical way. The unnamed protagonist narrates from her home where she's under house arrest for having broken one of the myriad rules of the Ange Suprême, or Supreme Angels, the party who track the movements of all residents of Zambaville, which is Boni's fictionalization of Abidjan. Taken together then, these two novels allow us to look at the specific navigation of space during civil war, a snapshot of which opened this paper, and a context which is described by Boni elsewhere as a society which survives in corruption, debouillardise, and is always on its toes, with women and children situated at risk on the front line. My current research project, Postcolonial Resilience? Question mark, addresses whether in such a context, the terminology of resilience makes sense. That is to ask whether resilience as a widespread behavioral descriptor and societal goal or societal target is useful for framing life in and around Ivorian crisis, life for Bonis, women and children on the front line. I align my views with those of David Chandler and others who write from an international relations perspective and see resilience discourse as perpetuating core assumptions of Eurocentric or Western thinking, particularly around notions of individual autonomy and regularity and linearity in time and space. Western policies of resilience understood as automated adaptation to the world, close off and are antithetical to understandings of communities as relationally open, following glissant, and as being situated in and amongst a world of flux and flows. The critique also encompasses the neoliberal framings of resilience discourse, its reliance on um, notions of empowerment, its colonial heritage, uh, its forms of government, and its tricky relationship with improvisation, but I'll leave those for another day. I'm interested mostly in creativity and mobility in that world of flux and flows. Beyond this discourse of resilience, then, I propose an alternative vocabulary centered around the concept of debouillardise. And usually I realize I speak with francophone um, scholars. So debouillardise comes from a verb se débrouiller, which in French kind of means to get by or to manage. The term though is used by citizens of Kinshasa to describe a spirit of survival characterizing everyday life in the city. By using this term, I mean more than a capacity for problem solving, rather something like a situated and creative expertise, which informs the way of being in the world. Situated because unlike forms of nomadic ontology, which are critiqued for being overly metaphorical or abstracted, Debriadis relies upon and emerges from contexts, most specific, uh, most often precarious contexts and creative because it is more than an impulse of reaction or repair. It includes strategic devices, gestures and rhythms and disavows the apolitical nihilism of a resilient subject who's sort of permanently struggling to accommodate themselves in the world. The city is the key site that fiction has provided for examining Debriatis. Adju Malik Simon, whose work on urban life in the global south, I'm sure many here know, asks how many actions are undertaken seemingly indifferent to the survival of the subject that undertakes them. In other words, crucially, the direction of life is not only set towards surviving, but as Simone puts it, in an extension towards a liveliness of things in general, a techniques of prolonging. Boni's text is set in une ville, oh sorry, a city a city where the fight for life is the rule to follow, and it's the fight for life, la vie, as opposed to just to live or to remain alive. Simone describes the city as a conjunction of seemingly endless possibilities of remaking for variously located actors who maneuver and resituate themselves. My description of such practice as a kind of expertise should become clear in the examples below, where it is set against colonial systems of knowledge formation that are openly derided. Michel de Certeau, in writing of everyday life, gestures towards that artful nature of knowing a city where space is a practiced place and character agents condition that space through their ways of being. This embodied knowledge, the shift away from strength and survival, the play and creativity, 
all go some way to indicate how I'm drawing distinctions between resilience and Debbie Hadiz. As such, this moves us away from the assumptions of a status quo, which after any given crisis subsides, is returned to, along with the stable, predictable future, which is apparently subsumed within the assurances of resilience discourse. It also moves African subjects out of the reductive bonds of vulnerability and victimhood they have so often been tied into. It has relevance for levels of the individual, the collective and the city, and as such, WRD stands as a way to bring the city into some kind of focus, as a way to render visible forms of action or life left opaque, when during conflict, cities can only be seen as battlegrounds or stalled or fractured infrastructure. For the remainder of the paper, then, I'll illustrate this kind of expertise with just two examples, one taken from each novel. So the first is linked to mobility, and the second will be um, networks. So Debris Ardiz as mobile. Moving away from this concept of resilience as a return to stability requires us to acknowledge the intrinsic role of movement. Debris Ardiz relies on shift and flux and helps us see that movement is not a temporary state or instability a temporary state for a nation or an individual, but an intrinsic way of being. And in these texts it emerges at um, in several levels. Um, I, I won't go into the details of um, the na national city and individual, but these are the three levels and the history of mobility in Côte d'Ivoire has um, really shifted who belongs, who doesn't, who's allowed to have a, who, who's allowed to have a passport and who doesn't. And that's changed dramatically in the last 30 years um, back and forth and is at the root of some of, some of the violence. Um, so these three levels are present in, in, the, in the novels. For, for Ashil Bembe, mobility is what conditions the development of post-colonial Africa. And the lines he sketches are frenetic lines in truth, which break endlessly, continually change direction, opening the way to whirlwind movement. These come out in spontaneous movements in any event at any time and are soaked in what he terms complication and ambivalence. So that is to say movement is never poeticized to the point of romanticization, as is evident in these novels. So the story in Quentin Rufus en Dinan, Amadou Karouma's novel, is a journey taken by Birahima and Fanta from Dalawa in the south of the country towards Bouake in the northeast. Following a massacre in her town, one of multiple expuls expulsions in the novel, Fanta seeks safety in the north. They don't reach their destination. In fact, Karuma died before he finished the novel and it was published posthumously with two possible endings contributed by an editor. Birahima is a former child soldier, having fought in Liberia, Muslim, who volunteers himself to travel as guardian to Catholic Fanta, with whom he is besotted. As the pair stop off overnight and continue on their way, stop off and continue, their repeated refrain, which is uh, bottom right on the screen, this is in a kind of Malinke inflected French, which is typical of Karuma, reads, nous avons pris pied la route, so we took our feet on the way. The repetitious pedestrian nature of the text illustrates the length of the journey where threats of violence are so frequent they become almost commonplace. Yet in that phrase, there is also a commitment to shift, to move forwards. They're propelled to leave Dalawa in the first place, a city of criminals and barbarians, which refugees flood out of as if there was a plague. Leaving one city under stress, plagued by violence, they are nonetheless propelled towards another in the promise of opportunities or Simone's possibilities that await there. And that pull push between cities demonstrates that even though much of the novel happens in rural contexts, the city remains the reference point that Ganeng identifies, even when it's not the explicit backdrop. For both protagonists, Dalawa as a town has been a key seat de formation, a training ground that proves more or less helpful on their journey. I defined Debriadis as a kind of expertise expressed in these novels in the form of mobility. And in Karuma's text, this streetwise modus operandi is set in stark distinction to Fanta's stultifying discourse on the story of the nation. Fanta uses the journey to educate the Rahima in her version of the history and politics of Côte d'Ivoire, where her valuing of a pacifist word has been interpreted um, in contradiction to Birahima's barbaric weapons and violence, I would offer a less reductionist view of the so-called uneducated boy's usefulness, for want of a better word. For his experiences have seen him ready and able to navigate 240 kilometers of road and save Fanta's life on numerous occasions. I'll take one example of where his expertise is mobilized, whereas her knowledge is stultifying. 
Um, I'll paraphrase the French. So on one occasion, when the pair are set upon by 16 young rebels armed with machetes, uh, Birahima turns around and shoots his Kalashnikov up in the air to scare them. Once the men have run away, the two protagonists laugh, seeing them flee. And the very next sentence reads, it's that sentence at the bottom of the quotation, Fanta continued teaching the history of the Ivory Coast. Appearing almost indifferent to the danger to their lives, Fanta goes on and on. There are pages long passages of history lessons which parody the oral epic. Her verbosity and objective history textbook style is at the heart of Karuna's irony. The primacy of a, uh, an assumedly French education and colonial forms of knowledge is parodied in such a way that allows alternative forms of expertise to emerge. Fonta's lessons are always followed by a course summary, C-O-A-R-S-E, course summary, on the part of Birahima his interpretation more often than not informed by vulgar language and a derisive tone. In this way, we're removed rhythmically from the violence and then thrown back close to it. Birahima chimes in self-deprecation and his bravado promises in a bid to impress Fanta, place all hope on his eventual brevet bac et licence, which are the French kind of national education qualifications. Me, little Birahima, I got it all without understanding it all. Whatever I haven't understood for now will be well understood with my dictionaries once I'm real good for the high school certificates. He seems to attribute these objects of French education with a kind of magic, but since this phrase is repeated at least 11 times in the novel, the phrase is saturated with irony and bleached of meaning. Alongside his rhetorics of praise for the French French of real French people from France, he moderates and vulgarizes the language continually. His ironic med mediations indicate he is wiser than he makes out. Birahima, as primary narrator of the tale, declares repeatedly that he's ignorant, but his knowledge of the violent landscape and the realities of war and death is what keeps them alive. Ultimately, the value of his knowledge is shown in his ability to move fast and protect them, allowing them to go on their way and for the more physically vulnerable Fanta to remain safe. The juxtaposition of two forms of knowledge, one derided and one enhanced by an experience of mobility, forms a pointed critique of colonial and post-colonial power practices. Birahima finds himself far better equipped for navigating these spaces than Fanta. His awareness of the provisional is an embodied expertise. Returning to Bembe, he says, the wandering subject produces himself in the unknown by means of a chain of effects that is at times calculated but never materializes exactly in the ways foreseen. It is within the unexpected and within radical instability that the wandering subject creates and invents himself. So movement is a subtext that undermines the very notion of autoxony, but also sits in friction with ideas of resilience and knowledge that are based on an ideal of stability or fixedness. When Seri Wayoro, who was the national director of identification within Bagbo's Operation Nationale d'identification, claims that originally people in Ivory Coast were sedentary, they stayed on their homelands. It is clear to see how an active erasure of histories of migration is used to serve the purposes of a politics of ethno-nationalization. In such discourse, the place of the village, which Bembe defines as the territory par excellence, is primary. And the city, a place undeniably inscribed with the history of immigration, urbanization, and mixed ancestry, is pushed out of sight. Pana Leboni, uh, the image of the book is, should be up there, but mine is covered with your faces. Tana Leboni's um, depiction of the capital city reveals all those histories actively overlaid and reactivated in networks of Debbie Adif. So I'll finish the paper by discussing this second text. I'm going to talk now so about Debriades as expressed in networks. I've networked as a rely, sorry, as a way of being reliant on connections with others, which are actively and creatively renewed and drawn on. This necessarily moves us away from concepts of survival as autonomous and resilience as a developed individualism, which shores up the subject against any possible outside influence. Rather, Debriades is an active network stance but not necessarily as loyalty to normative categories of race, gender, religion, class necessarily, but towards who is with you, where you are with what you have. Simone elaborates on the historical, economic and political context of African cities, setting the stage for the informalization of large portions of everyday life. And within this, he refers to the disparate and temporary relations as ensemble work. So I'm holding that term alongside my term network. 
On one hand, this is a novel about multiple imprisonments, psychological, familial, social, and political. But Matin de Couvrefeu is also a novel of networks, underscored by a recurring vocabulary of words such as string, link, channel, chain, and circulation. The novel contains multiple interwoven strands of a family story, extending branches of that same family's tree, webs of lies and deceit, a double layered network of surveillance, and frustrated economies of objects, most notably taxis and telephones, which circulate and form or refuse to form links to transfer information and power. What I want to talk about is a female network of debris that is connected by a more than survival ethic and circulation of stories. The nameless protagonist, a successful businesswoman, takes herself to what she calls a rough area of the city in a bid to find a way out of her stifling situation, which is house arrest. With this example, I want to underline what I said at the beginning of this paper regarding context to demonstrate that Debriades is a contextualized, situated navigation of space rather than an autonomous, abstracted existence as a self-contained, uninfringible resilient subject. Here, the description of the Bafon, which is like a, a term for ghetto, is a crystallization of the precarity and crush of Abidjan. In this district, no road was tarmacked. There were cracks everywhere, which turned into muddy pools in the rainy season. And the dyers were set up close to one another on this bit of cramped land between the houses and the lagoon, which, to be honest, had no banks. And all year long, it was there that malaria found fertile soil for its rampant spread. The sense of precarity, danger, overcrowding and dirt is almost tangible. Yet it is here, pourtant c'est là aussi, that she finds women on their feet, conscious of their fate and of their interests. It is specifically within this city space that opportunities for developing Debriadis lie. Pourtant c'est dans ce décor, oh excuse me, and yet it's in this incredibly overcrowded setting that. The repetition of pourtant and yet is an insistence on these women's work ethic more than survival ethic, a commitment to lucrative creative work. And Boney then goes on to describe the repeated plural actions as a systematic process of waxing, dyeing, cleaning, drying, beating and folding, which is in Simone's apt words, adding something different to the fabric of mere survival. And they were there, these women, ready to get down to work from morning to nightfall, carrying out moves whose origins got lost in the twists of time. At times they used indigo, the ancient pigments, with an intensely blue blue that enhanced the cloth's beauty. But this matchless blue would leave stains on hands and body parts that came into contact with the dye. These were multicolored women, not sad at all. Humanity that was well and warm and resistant to every ordeal worked in this unexpected place. The marketplace persists in spite of polluted waters. Fabric is colored in spite of the overcrowding. Simone writes that in circumstances of intense volatility in the city, residents cannot be viewed as simply adding to the repetition of an endless grind of drudgery and dissolution. It is here that the creative act of waxing and dyeing is crucial. It's productive in the face of decay in a seemingly effortless deployment of collective knowledge. What is more, as Boney writes elsewhere, those navigating the marketplace need to know its specific rules, how to pull the strings and work its reach beyond the city. And I'm thinking of cities as the kind of launch pad for other global networks, however problematic. <clears throat> These rules are not part of any universal set, but need to be understood in situ. And um, I won't go into it, but there's layers of meaning within the pan, so the cloths that the women are dying. There's patterns and names for different patterns, which would mean different things. Um, and uh, I've put a cloth uh, behind, which is a sculpture by Yinka Shonibara and B.E. to indicate this. There's a final element, I'm, my time's up, so I'm not going to read that paragraph, but there's a final element of Debriades, which um, emerges in a kind of circulation of stories between women, um, both imagined, written, and oral. So Birahima, the child soldier, escorting Fanta to a seemingly safer city in Canton refusant Dinan and the imprisoned entrepreneurial protagonist of Matin de Couvrefeu could be described as resilient. Against the odds, they survive in the violence of civil war. However, that descriptor forecloses some of what I've shown to be in evidence. That is to say, some of the possibilities and gestures which make up their way of being. Rather than merely surviving in a reach towards a stable future resembling some kind of universal status quo, they are on the move responding to in the intensified uncertainties of their urban lives. 
By recourse to new vocabularies of modes of living with stress and renewal, we can bring the city into a kind of focus that reveals strategic and networked ways of navigating precarious life, which operate at the margins of power, in this case, child soldiers and women. I've argued that debris and particularly its expression in mobility and ensemble or networks is one interesting term in this vocabulary extending beyond resilience. In Côte d'Ivoire specifically, revitalized modes of thinking through subjecthood and citizenship are urgently required given the destructive history of autochthony and its divisive reliance on a dichotomy of pure and borrowed citizenship. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was wonderful. I'm full of questions, but we'll hang on to them to the Q&A. We are now going to pivot to our second presenter, Lisa. Hello, let me share my screen. Is that working? Great, great. Um, making space for a free black public, free towns in Orange County, Virginia, 1865 to 1920. Toni Morrison opens her novel, Sula, quote, in that place where they tore the nightshade and blackberry patches from their roots to make room for the Medallion City Golf Course, end quote. Now a white suburb, that place was known during the action of the novel as The Bottom, an ironic name for a farming settlement perched on the crest of a high hill accessible only by a narrow footbridge over the river that separated it from the white settlement in the valley below. The bottom's origin story, Morrison tells us, was recounted as a joke in which a white farmer tricks his enslaved black worker into thinking the steep barren land that he offers him in exchange, along with his freedom, in exchange for some especially difficult work was actually good, quote, bottom land, rich and fertile. It turns out to be hard scrabble, quote, hilly land, where planting was backbreaking, where the soil slid down and washed the seeds, and where the wind lingered all through the winter, end quote. There, bottom black folks suffered heavily in their thin houses and their thinner clothes, end quote. It was no joking matter, of course, the way slave owners unloaded the worst of their farmland onto formerly enslaved black laborers eager to own and farm their own property after emancipation. Myths abound even now of Southern plantation owners who gave or sold land on favorable terms to their former slaves, but in truth, farmland had lost so much of its value during the war that it was affordable to black buyers who, like the gullible laborer in Morrison's novel Sula, bought the worst land and yet somehow managed not only to eke a living from it, but to build a community there with other black landowners. In another fictional example, this one from a novel written by Albion Tourget, <clears throat> as another example of, the, of these black settlements during Reconstruction. Tourget, a fascinating figure, um, an advocate for black rights, who was one of the attorneys who litigated and lost Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896. He wrote several novels, all set during Reconstruction, including Bricks Without Straw in 1880, in which a farming settlement called Red Wing serves as the setting for a story of black achievement and community building. Nimbus Ware, the black hero of the novel, is a formerly enslaved late farm laborer in North Carolina who partners with a childhood friend, the literate shoemaker Eliab Hill, who is also the community's preacher, to buy a tobacco farm following the war. Like the white slave owner who hoodwinks the black farmer in Morrison's Sula, this fictional plantation master sells the men, quote, a perfectly barren, piney old field, located at a crossroads upon a high sandy ridge, which was thought to be too poor to raise peas on. But in a twist that unfortunately had few nonfiction analogs in the post-emancipation South, the two black farmers turned that subpar land into the most successful tobacco farm in the county. They then buy several hundred more acres of adjacent land, which they divide into small parcels and sell to other black farmers. To the growing community of, quote, snugly built log cabins, end quote, the residents soon add a church, a schoolhouse, and a store and attract new settlers, quote, 
mostly mechanics, carpenters, and masons, a blacksmith who wrought for himself, and some farm laborers who dreaded the yearly system of hire as too nearly allied to the slave regime and so worked by day upon the neighboring plantations. All had built cheap log houses, but their lots were well fenced and their truck patches clean and thrifty. And the little hamlet was far from being unattractive, set as it was in the midst of the green forests which belted it about. From the plantations on either side, the children flocked to the school." End quote. Except for the over-the-top success of the tobacco farm, Morrison and Tourget both give us apt descriptions of how black settlements formed in rural areas during the years following emancipation. A farmer or artisan who had accumulated savings during his enslavement, which was not unheard of, or from wages earned following the war, bought or pooled his money with others to acquire a tract of subpar land from a local plantation owner, sometimes their former enslaver, which they then farmed and or subdivided into parcels that they sold to other emancipated black citizens. Soon a church was built and then a schoolhouse and often a lodge hall and then a store. These were generally sited along either side of a short length of road, often at a crossroads. But these stories of black community development following the war have seldom been told in fiction or anywhere else. The two fictional examples I quoted for you all earlier are exactly half of the ones I've found so far. I will gladly collect any you might want to drop into the chat or email me about later. And let me just note quickly that I'm not talking about incorporated black towns, uh, many of which have been thoroughly documented. Contemporaneous nonfiction accounts of these rural settlements are almost as hard to find. Recent scholarship is also sparse with, with one very notable exception being the state of Texas <clears throat> where scholars Thad Sitton and James Conrad, and particularly and Andrea Roberts, pictured here, have done painstaking and path-breaking research into what they have termed freedom colonies in that state. Grounded in oral histories collected by the scholars themselves over the last few decades, these scholars have identified more than 500 black settlements built during and after Reconstruction, including many city neighborhoods and quasi-suburban quasi settlements founded by migrating black citizens. Inspired by Robert's database, I'm currently collaborating on a project to locate, map, and annotate the locations of about 50 rural Reconstruction era settlements in four central Virginia counties, which for now I'm terming Freetowns after the name given to one of them by its inhabitants. And here is my very, very messy um, ArcGIS map of those Freetowns. Tibbstown, Jacksontown, Freetown, Shady Grove, Little Petersburg. My interest in these settlements started as an offshoot of research I'm doing for a book about the history of the cultural landscape anchored by President James Madison's plantation house known as Montpelier in Orange County. And it flows from my earlier work on shantytown, urban shantytowns in the 19th and early 20th century. And we'll pause here for shameless self-promotion. Research that included African-American shantytowns built in Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and many other cities during that period. Shanty towns have been ignored by historians, but once I started looking, I found them all over popular and material culture of the period. They were part of the discourse of race and class from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th and beyond. Not so black rural settlements from the post-war period. So far, eyewitness accounts from the 19th century, fiction or nonfiction, are elusive. So while I search for those, I've turned my attention to the vestiges left on the actual landscape, which are informed by published oral histories of Freetown descendants. Today I want to talk a little bit about the evidence on the, of the landscape and what it suggests about the priorities, expressive as well as practical, of the earliest post-emancipation post rural black community builders. I'm especially interested in considering whether or not these spaces could or should be considered public spaces. They were, after all, created by the first free black rural public in the southern United States, able for the first time to assemble legally without a white person present. But we're not accustomed to thinking about public space in rural areas. Clearly, emancipated black citizens created public spaces in urban areas. There's a vibrant literature on this. But did they do the same in rural areas? Can I consider the free towns of Orange County examples of black public space and accounts in books like Bricks Without Straw, 
interpretations, albeit white interpretations, of those spaces? Can these accounts help me begin to theorize a notion of rural publics that might amplify or contradict our notion of urban publics? Orange County's free towns, I think, offer some places to begin. So Orange County, Virginia, you can imagine the ocean over here on the right. Orange County is located uphill and west of the former capital of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia. These fertile rolling hills are known as the Piedmont and they lie between the coastal plain that marks the state's eastern border where some of the first European settlements on the continent were established and the Shenandoah Mountains that bracket it on the west. This region was confiscated from the Monacan nation by English colonists in the early 18th century, a group that included the ancestors of our fourth US president, James Madison. Its development as a tobacco and then wheat growing region depended entirely upon the labor of enslaved black workers, many of whom were brought or descended from people forcibly brought from West Africa in the early 18th century. At the time of emancipation in 1863, there were about 6,000 enslaved laborers in Orange County. Many labored on a dozen or so large plantations, but as elsewhere in the South, some labored on smaller farms. There were also about 130 free black people living in the county at the end of the Civil War. The very first things emancipated laborers did was to establish independent churches. And it is there that I begin my search for public space in these black settlements. Here's that image of that messy map of Freetowns with churches added, and you see immediately the overlap. Before emancipation, enslaved people could only worship openly with white congregations, although some managed to attend sermons led by black preachers in camouflaged brush arbors, four poles covered with pine branches deep in the wood. Tracing your congregation to a brush arbor is still a point of pride today. After emancipation, black congregants met in members' homes until they could build a church, in rural Virginia, these were overwhelmingly Baptist, a denomination that invests decision-making power in individual congregations. In Orange County, a dozen or more black Baptist churches were built during the 1870s and 1880s. I spent a blissful three days last summer driving around to see them, and I was very struck by their design similarities. Only one, Mount Calvary, is landmarked on the National Register of Historic Places, which gives it a, a modicum of protection and tax um, benefit. <clears throat> I'm happy to rant in the Q&A about why so few black churches are landmarked in the United States. In its National Register nomination form, Mount Calvary is described as, quote, a vernacular adaptation of a Gothic revival, one-story frame church, entered through, a, uh, entered through a projecting bay centered in a front gable. That description fits most of the others you see here. While it may never be possible to name the individuals who built these structures, oral histories of free towns often include the names of carpenters and builders in these settlements. I've identified two such free towns as carpenters in Orange County, Jackson Town, and Freetown, and expect to find more as I read other descendants' accounts. So a few things that, that strike me about these churches. Um, their, their visibility surprised me. Um, every single one of them is a veritable beacon on the landscape, perching on the crest of hills, looming around a curve in the road, commanding broad vistas. I, of course, can't recreate the landscape from 1880, but a hill is still a hill. They speak loudly of the rights of the builders, not only to the building sites, but to the surrounding landscapes. Rights newly affirmed by the United States Congress, but long owned by the laborers who worked this land. The one church, it's I think it's, it's um, the third from the top, <laughs> on the top row, um, that was in a dip in the road, um, had, so it actually had added an entire like um, story to its um, tower so that it too can be seen from the main road. These exposed positions surprised me, but I did note that many of them were also defensively located across a stream or river from the white settlement or separated by railroad tracks or surveying a vista from which an assault could be spotted and there were assaults. The second thing that strikes me is their design. Um, they share a Gothic Revival vocabulary. Why Gothic Revival? The style was wildly popular in the North, but never permeated the South to the same extent. Maybe that's why. They're not whimsical enough to be considered carpenter Gothic, but they differ markedly from the white churches that these congregations broke off from, which were um, stolid, barn-like classical temples. 
So three things um, that I note about the publicness of these spaces. Each has a cemetery attached to it. Death and burial, which had been conducted clandestinely during enslavement, also went public after emancipation, with burial societies proliferating and elaborate funeral processions often conducted in the regalia of black fraternal lodges, which were also pro proliferating, commemorating the end of life across these landscapes. Two, bells. One in every bell tower, which is the most prominent feature of every design. Many churches have preserved their bells and some display them outside of their buildings. Bells amplified the congregation's presence on the landscape as did the noisy church services themselves, full of the singing, chanting, and other vocal expressions of the Holy Spirit that rural Baptist congregations engaged in. Congregations that gathered in brush arbors, also known as hush arbors, filled, they claimed, the landscape with sounds of praise, celebration, and grief. And these churches were networks. Every free town from this period was associated with a church. They were the hubs in the wheel of the networks of free towns. Pastors, at first locals, but soon graduates of two new black seminaries in Richmond and Lynchburg, Virginia, were itinerant, traveling between two, three, or perhaps four congregations in the same area. Church met twice a month at most in, in, your, in, your, own, um, in your own sanctuary. On the off Sundays, entire congregations travel to other nearby churches to hear their or another itinerant preacher preach and attend Sunday school, revivals, and share, quote, dinner on the ground, festive picnics, but also functioned as many family reunions. Annual homecomings provided another opportunity to gather, and as the years passed, attracted hundreds of attendees. These continue a day. Did this custom of weekly crisscrossing the countryside to attend each other's churches create a black sense of place and belonging larger than one's own free town and larger in scope than the sense of community experienced by white residents without similar patterns of religious cross-pollination? The congregations gathering at these events constituted a black rural public despite the religious nature of the gathering site. Historians have written compellingly about the pl black public sphere generated by cities during Reconstruction and the centrality of the black church in that phenomenon. But with the exception of Stephen Hahn's landmark, A Nation Under Our Feet, Black Political Struggles in the Rural South from Slavery to the Great Migration, few historians have paid any attention to what was happening in rural areas where the vast bulk of African Americans lived. As late as 1920, only 25% of black Americans lived in urban areas the same moment when the total urban population tipped over 50% in the United States. And as I noted before, churches were only the first public buildings constructed following emancipation. Schools, lodge halls, and stores followed. Here are a couple of school buildings. Each was located uh, right next, excuse me, <clears throat> to a church. And then here, um, an image, this is um, called Shady Grove Baptist Church, and you can see the, the white vestige of the original church in what is now the much um, added on uh, added on to an expanded church building. Here's their bell. This is a lodge, a Prince Hall Lodge that was um, down the street and the church right next door. So we know that black urban institutions, the black church chief among them, were sites of resistance, struggle, and empowerment that led ultimately to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. What about the countryside? where in 1960, half of the black population of the South still lived. <clears throat> Much of the land purchased by emancipated black citizens in rural areas in Virginia remains in the same families today. Do free towns offer a counter narrative to the great migration as a site of staying put? And in the South, not just staying put, but buying property and creating communities on the same grounds where these people were previously enslaved. Publics and counterpublics, of course, aren't tethered to physical spaces. They can be imagined, virtual, discursive. But we have treated public space as essentially urban. Can it be rural? Did a black rural public create space for itself in settlements founded during Reconstruction? What might it mean if it did? I'll share two barely half-formed thoughts with you. Did a clear difference between rural and urban location, it is a clear difference between rural and urban locations, the greater anonymity afforded residents of cities. Indeed, 
Anonymity or the ability to create spaces where it can thrive seems an essential quality of urban public spaces. There was little or no anonymity in the country. Lodge halls with their second floors located out of sight of white neighbors provided privacy of a kind unavailable to groups of enslaved black laborers before emancipation. <clears throat> Will I find a particular kind of interaction between private and public spaces in rural areas as opposed to cities and towns? This period also saw the birth of private spaces for black people, or publicly, pub, I think of it as public, publicly private spaces um, for black people, spaces that, that, were, that they proclaimed as private, um, for they had no rights to privacy at home church or anywhere else when they were enslaved. That's not to say enslaved laborers didn't find ways to meet in private, but only to say that there was an explosion of new opportunities for both public and private encounters after emancipation. Does black autonomy develop differently or utilize space differently in the country compared to the city? Two, or were rural publics only constituted in relation to, ur to urban publics? Emancipated black rural residents routinely travel to cities to work, Richmond and Washington DC, yes, but also Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and New York. Are there patterns that we now call re-migration between rural Virginia and these urban centers that created regional identities and relationships or even national relationships and identities. I'm also interested in the much higher degree of movement across the rural landscape on the part of black residents as opposed to white. Were rural centers not as isolated as we tend to think, were they rather home places that operated in concert with urban satellites? And I noticed Hannah in her talk you know, mentioned the reference point of the city. Um, I guess what I, I'm suggesting is could the reference point have been the rural? In closing, I'm going to return very briefly to the two fictional back settlements I began with. In Albion Tourget's novel Bricks Without Straw, set in Reconstruction, North Carolina, the village of Red Wing gets so big, so prosperous, that community leaders demand the establishment of a polling place. This enrages the white residents who, cloaked in the hoods of their Ku Klux Klan chapter, attack the village and burn down the church and the school. Toni Morrison's fictional settlement, The Bottom, has a different outcome. As the decades passed, white residents began to covet the cool breezes and mountain views on the land they once thought, thought of as bottom and repossess it for a golf course and fancy housing development. It was sad, Morrison writes, with her usual lack of sentimentality, because the bottom had been a real place. These young ones keep talking about the community, but they left the hills to the poor, the old, the stubborn, and the rich white folks. Maybe it hadn't been a community, but it had been a place. Now there weren't any places left, just separate houses with separate televisions and separate telephones and less and less dropping by, end quote. I haven't done enough research yet to know how or why the free towns I'm studying in central Virginia faded away or burned to the ground by white mobs. I will not be surprised to learn that white violence played a major role as I've already found evidence of lynchings and other violence toward black residents in this area. It's also possible the forces of suburbanization and gentrification gradually erased them. Certainly today, what's left of these places, a crumbling lodge hall, an ancient cemetery, a falling down schoolhouse, are threatened by the long tentacles of gentrification in the DC metro area. Thanks for letting me share some details about them with you today. I would love to hear your thoughts about how to use these settlements to illuminate black rural public space or rural public more generally, if you have them. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much, Lisa. And let's now turn Olajide to you uh, for our third and final paper before uh, we then pivot to Q&A. All right. Um, thank you all um, for this opportunity to share my ideas with you on contemporary realm of geopolitics uh, in Nigeria. Uh, my papers basically have focused on rural consciousness and scholarships that have tended to focalize urbanity with sparse attention or its entanglement with the rural space. I build my argument within the Nigerian context, fear the cinematic paradigm of a uh, new Nollywood using the example of Mulea for Lions, the figurine. 
the and the insight it instigates, I critically reflect on what contemporary literary and cultural studies on Nigeria geopolitics focalize and what they shun. Even though we may argue that the rural space possess a distinct spatial identity territorially mapped outside the urban sprawl, the history of the post colony, as actually Bimbi maintains, has only furthered the interwovenness of histories, cultures, but also spatial, spatial liaison implicated also in the modern regimes of mobility from the rural space to the urban and from the urban space to the rural. The paper therefore attends to the question of post-colonial geopolitics that shapes the rural space as a subordinated uh, space and how literary and cultural critics in their discussions reify the hegemony of the urban discourse. What remains crucial is that Nigeria is geographically and fastly rural. It is therefore impelling to trace the primacy of what literary and cultural scholarship in this direction may fetch. It is clear that with the reduced attention of the literary and cultural scholarship, there is all also politics going on. I advance this argument using Afolayan's theme. So the term figurine, in essence, is a titular inflection from the theme to pass through the images of spatial figuration. See how this cultural text apprehends us with more consciousness on the rural space. So the paper does not make any grand claim that the rural space has zero acknowledgement from critical quarters of in Nigerian cultural scholarship, but as literature responds to the mode and of colonialism and postcolonialism, images of the reality are bound in Nigerian literary and cultural imaginaries in works such as Things Fall Apart by Chino Achebe, which is one of the most important texts in African literary canon, and I dare say the introduction of many people to Nigerian literature, there is a strong rural impulse of the pre-colonial Nigeria. When the Greece world has categorized TFA as a village novel, Umo fears Bukolicity as its internal struggle politically, but Achebe provides an imaginative account which is helpful in reading the rural, first as indigenous and later as an anti-colonial space, as observed in the social political sensibilities the work aestheticized. What followed such a literary landmark was the for, from the opposite angle. Cipra Equency in Burning Grass provides some fresh breath into the pastoral culture and competing colonial forces, competing colonial forces in northern Nigeria. Indeed, the earlier post-colonial years produced a more complex literary ecosystem than what one may think. Equence's burning grass is more provocative. Critics have analyzed his work as a pro-colonial work and that extolled imperialism above pastoral culture. So the post-colonial period is a phase of radical urbanization that provokes literary and cultural production. No sooner the modernity project and its attendant economic social tension were in place than the each tones of criticism also followed. Urbanity becomes ubiquitous in Nigerian literary cultural scholarship with Lagos and its enduring presence. In short, there are now Lagos novels as a category of John that results from what one may describe as part of the post-colonial incredible of urban capital. Among the recent prominent articulations around the work textualizing Lagos are Lola Condé's The City in the African Novel, a thematic rendering of urban spaces, Stephanie Newell's Histories of Death, Media and Urban Life in Colonial and Postcolonial Lagos, and the edited volume of Fasi de Mise, which you know, a, 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 a chapter is dedicated to Lagos as part of in, imperial legacies and uh, postcolonial predicament. So what this paper attends to is to prompt more attention on the images and fiction on the rural space in Nigerian culture, especially in the provoking work of Kunle Afolayan. I observe also the gap in the cultural scholar taking cue from the perception that the film gets in authoring Nollywood, critical perspective on the figuring, which was developed on the film as part of celebration of Kunle Afolayan as an auteur that inaugurates a new historical phase in Nigerian cultural space. I treat Afolayan's work as an allegorical text that can constantly direct attention to the rural space as a significant site that should be restituted to be known, to be studied through its characters, rhetorical strategies, cinematographic shots, and other elements of representative practices. The film repels an entanglement which positions the rural space as a cultural and economic commodity for the urban to exploit as well. Kuli Afolayan has often been discussed as both neo Nollywood and post Nollywood, a beginner of new tradition of Nigerian films with more political and ideological concerns. It's arguable to say the urban right dynamics upon which the film grows has always been there in the Nollywood representative practice, as most of the film showcase modernity through Lagos. For example, even in Bondis, which is often claimed to be to launch Nollywood, is also sustained on this trope. 
there is a consciousness of urban, rural urban migration in the films that permitted late 20th century and continued to thrive in the early 21st century in films uh, as Nollywood, as, as Nigerian witnessed a boom in cultural production. In evolving media, popular, in evolving popular media, Ines and Hokome maintain that living in bondage exemplifies the characteristic of handling of the urban scene. Living body touches simultaneously on social and economic issues that often follow the uncivilized subject of the rural space and when they move from the village to the city. Both the rural and the urban appear to operate not on a binary, but a nexus. As the image of the city and urban looms large in the production, so does the rural space as the plot propels the protagonist. But the fatality remains with the urban space and Lagos. These films arrive with social and spatial consciousness of Nigerian geopolitics. We are Lagos of Fungane as a place where the Ramagan moved to for the purported economic sources that the city signifies. In the last decades, many groundbreaking works have developed in the critical field of Nigerian films. One work that set the tone for the revolution witnessed through Nollywood evolution is Nigerian video films edited by Jonathan Haynes. The book explores the tremendous mutation of Nollywood, its aesthetics, thematics, imaginative practices, and how the phenomenon is reshaping the cultural experience and industry in Nigeria through the boom of video film. The book also announces itself as a rejuvenation in tradition of criticism owing to the collapse of academic industry in Nigeria. Hence, the conclusion that follows the book will be an intensive work of reading that moves beyond the surface scratch of film reviews. Different studies in the canonical scholarship are animated with an array of concern from the political, social, historical to the purely aesthetics. For example, Brian Larkin in the work takes framework of appropriate to probe the cultural atmosphere of modern Nigerian video film industry. In his own contribution to the forum, Okome addresses the gender dynamics in Glamour Girl, which follows the village city trope. In a sense, most of the critics are pressed with the precious and strife of Lagos modernity. Although scholarship are less to be blamed for the continual attention that urbanity and Lagos continue to receive in this film, the event that constitute the structure and core of the film circulate around the city. There is a low tone on rurality or rural space in the forum. If, as Ines and Hokome 1998 argue that the urban space is fundamental to the understanding of Nigerian geopolitics, I will argue, on the other hand, that the rural scene is also integral not only to the rural space, but to the Nigerian urban spatial distribution in a network that links all of them together. Most recent work are also pressed by such concern of urbanity, where Lagos remains ever referential. In this, for instance, in Nollywood in Lagos, Lagos in Nollywood attends to how Nollywood structures the cultural scene of Lagos in terms of marketing, distribution, and informal circulation of films among the urban public. Moreover, he also acknowledged the dominant image and fiction of Lagos in, in, in Nollywood films. So bearing, embracing in departure, critical inquiry on the figuring. Only Afolan has often been celebrated as the face of New Nollywood. If his film, Irapada, arrives a, a, a new face for a, a new turn in film and color production in Nigeria, one may argue that the figuring came to revive him, to clarify him as an enigma. Given the rave attention it received scholarly, it has remained one of the great examples of New Nollywood tradition, which began in the first decade of 21st century. It came as an answer to the culture of untidiness, sloopiness, which trade, trademark the whole Nollywood. These films are inspired by social concerns, concerns which the audience can immediately relate to, as Ines 2000 has added. But also, they are also marked with poor cinematography and the market culture exists within a semi formal context where sensational stories or rumors are immediately transformed into uh, plots, packaged, and marketed for the urban and rural public. Even then, the high rate of production will mean Nigeria is now a cultural power in Africa and a force to reckon with globally, co coming second behind Bollywood, India movie, India, India's movie industry. Films such as The Figuring marks a cultural turn in Nigeria. It's an evidence that Nigeria films are now even getting more critical attention after the following that was developed on the film. In the following, Additional Afolayan advances the case that although, as with old Nollywood, there may be little place, philosophy we have because there is little intellectual challenge, those films pause for the critical mind. Event of neo Nollywood is redefining the interaction between the fields of Nollywood studies and the philosophy. The new films create foundations and challenge scholars epistemologically and they familiarize the subjectivities they that they present, that they represent. By creating a complex context for us to interact and 
they also provoke us to think differently. The paradigmatic, paradigmatic shift occasioned through Neon Lodi is exemplary of films that emerge from a creative orientation that present cinematic experience in a different way. One of the indices that additional highlight as an essential element of the figuring as Neon Lodi is the capacity of agency. This capacity of agency is the ability to distinguish and retain uniqueness that is different from the chaotic cultural scene of the earlier tradition called Nollywood. Nonetheless, there are ambivalences of post-colonial period which are further defined special relationship, relationality, and rationality. Kuli Afolayan's The Figuring invite us to a cinematic dialogue of this post-colonial experience. Post-colonial space is rife with flux of movement, which can also be described from the phenomenon of spatial quality between the urban and the rural space, upon which this story of the film develops. And there is no doubt that the figuring underscores the place of the mysterious within the Yoruba cosmology and epistemic which constitute the film, but there is also the acquisition and role of human agency in the foregrounding of post-colonial subjectivities. This constitutes the focus of solar for lion, the figuring, the interplay of the mysterious and the orchestrated. Afloya pays attention to temporalities and concludes that the prologue presents a prehistoric African setting. This is contestable given the fact that what Afloya determines as prehistoric is 1908 at the height of colonialism. His study takes colonialism out of historical context. Also, his study pays little attention not only to the post colonial transition of the rural space of Iron Man. The, 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 this paper intends to fill, fulfill this gap in his study. In his own contribution to the forum, Af Afola B. Jima, 2014, look at the place of Yoruba tradition in rapidly changing post-colonial Africa. Although he maintains that there is a need to reevaluate re re the place of superstition mysticism in the modern experience which cherishes the science, technology, and impersonal logic. He also, dismiss, he also dismisses totally the extent and significance of the most of Yoruba word field. The study ignores the role of urbanity, even when it emphasizes the, the symbolics of Yoruba mode of percept perceptivity towards, cultural and, towards the culture and cultural materials. There is also sparse argument on the geopolitical dimension of cultural experience post-colonial rural Nigeria. How does the urban protagonist encounter the rural, the, the cultural in post-colonial Hararomere? Hararomere is where the film uh, is set, a rural a, a village which represent a typical village setting that has been touched by modernity at, as evidenced by the presence of NYSC camp. NYSC means Na National Youth Surface Corps in Nigeria. And as a history grounded in the Yoruba tradition, few undergathered by meat, ritual, magic, and sacrifice. The ruling legend in Ararumile village is that of an eponym eponymous deity that once descended on the village and based to seven years of stupendous riches and prosperity, after which wrecks the village with another seven years of mystery and destruction. James Yeku in the forum as well emphasizes the cultural hangul. The three trends emerge from the readings in the forum. The forum thinks of the rest space from the angle of culture because of its history without complicating the question of the post-colonial rest space. The studies ignore context and currency of restitution debates the film races. Also, the monarchy is placed in context of post-colonial Lagos and Yoruba public encounter with it. Most of these studies do, the, do emphasize the rare from the angle of the Yoruba mysticism super, superstition and the interface with the agents of mo modernity represented by the urban protagonist in the film. Even with this intensive critical investment in the film, their emphasis returns to urbanity, modernity, and aesthetics of the film as a post-colonial text. There is a sparse attention on post-colonial Harara Mere and its geopolitics with Nigeria arc urban space of Lagos. This paper, paper interferes in that regard through an inquiry of narrative logic of Kulia Folaya that makes the case for rural speciality. The rural imaginary, another subheading, Kulia Folaya's rural geopolitics. The rural imaginary in Kulia Folaya only of alliance, the figurine is conceived from Yoruba society during the height of colonialism. Although, as the event unfolded in the prologue, there are no evidences that the Yoruba Republic of Araromere have encountered the British colonial campaign, which was already established in Nigeria and then. As the temporalities of the film show, show, show the political setting is 1908, which was before the political amalgamation of Nigeria into two protectorates, Southern and Northern Protectorate by Lord Lugard. Once 
Hence, Iron Maria is presented as an indigenous Yoruba rural space that has not encountered colonialism and its purported modernity project. The rural subjects are still firmly rooted in Yoruba customs, values, and practices. To corroborate this figuration, Afolaya present the scene of the film in monochrome coloration as an aesthetic framing that can help us appreciate the historical potential which is given in the narrative. The significance of monochrome, therefore, is to foreground the effect of nostalgia of history of people in its original state and intro introspection into time. It is a way of producing historical conditions of people who have not wit wit witnessed Western modernity. Since the use of such coloration is optional now, film's technology is no longer nascent and it's only deployed in the film to open us to historical discourse and mythology of goddess Aaromere. As Eric Hansen has admonished in early discourses in color and cinema, origins, functions, and meanings that color in cinema cannot be evaluated outside specific cases, problems, and contexts. The figuration of black and white as an aesthetics which Avalonia offers at the beginning of may signify a way through which we compare an understanding of the historical and cultural condition upon which the film sits, but also can be read symbolically of presenting an instance of Nigeria as an ethnically heterogeneous, uh, since black and white will only expand the diversity and modernity. Aramira is a Yoruba space, Yoruba rural space. Its speciality evokes bucolic feelings in the scene of the cow who are seen grazing on the feet in the running stream and the women washing by the riverside. Farming thrives as a profession. In the first part of the prologue, we are ushered into a flourishing scene of farmland where cassava tuber crop is grown. It's a society setting wet, but I am a rural space where creativity flourishes. There are wood carefers who deal in images. Statues are fabricated from the abundance of timber that grows within the space. This essentially produce, places the film at threshold of cultural discourse more, as the film presents an instrument that is not only rustic for us, but also as creative investment in the production of statue and images. Um, Aramere's rural spiritualities are termed according to Yoruba metaphysics and cosmology, where goddess serve as intermediary between, between the providence and the people. In this trajectory, the office of the wood, wood cover becomes essential, is, is to manufacture effigy, which will embody goddess of Aramere, whose eponym is also the name of the village. Aramere mythology is predicated not only on the dualism of good and evil, but their entanglement. Yoruba thought system sheds more light on this framework as the popular idiom goes. This suggests the interconnected of evil, interconnectedness of evil and good and good, and cautions a monolithic perspective on particular favorable phenomenon. The Aramere effigy. The, the, this is immediately followed by another seven years of evil in which different disasters are feasted upon the people. Inflated by the inimical deeds of the goddess they, are, they have devoted their life to, the Aramere people move in rage to the shrine of the goddess and burn it down. A heavy gear is buried within the relics of the fallen rafter. Karim Baba's seminar study on Yoruba traditional practice showed that the extent of deity depends on availability of people who intend to serve such deity, that is, and who is power, and the splendor depends on it having many attentive devotees to glorify its name. And Orisa without devotee fades into insignificance as far as the human community is concerned. The devotee can choose within the limit which Orisa she will devote herself to. If our original Orisha fails to give her what she deserves, maybe a child, Sussex in trading, recovery from protected illness, she may approach another deity or Orisha at, at, until she finds one that responds to her request. So after the prelude of this film, to move on, the film moves towards forward a century after the event of the, uh, the goddess destruction in the village, as the feeling of the story is seen, walking uh, uh, laggardly towards his house in Lagos. So we have the prologue and then we have the, the main body of the film, where we say the, the protagonist, the feeling of the film, walking laggardly to his house in Lagos. 
Since 2001, at the beginning of a new century, it's also a post-colonial phase in which Nigeria has undergone a radical urban development as seen with image integers of mobility networks, third road, objects of technology such as mobile phones. It's also an era of movement where rural spaces are highly connected to the urban true road and the infrastructure of commerce. The plot is an emotional triangle between, the main plot is an emotional triangle between the three friends, Mola, Muna, Sola, and Femi. This emotional episode shows the rightful love so the rifle love can cause among friends. Mona is in love with Shola, but both of whom also attend the university with her, the same university with her. Femi studies archaeology and his academic format is not outstanding. He exudes antisocial habits such as smoking and drinking. His physiology also expresses that of a Rovian. Although Mona has also remained an object of affection from Femi too. Mona prefers Sola, who often treats her with insouciance. This unrequited emotional gestures Femi suffers from and further complicate their relationship. The film boards within a post-colonial political history of Nigeria. The geopolitics of post-colonial cannot be understood outside the event of civil war, which happened between 1967 to 1970, in which Nigeria went into war with the Eastern region, which is mainly, mainly ethnically populated by the Hebrew. So many reconciliatory policies were initiated after the civil war, and one of them is National Youth Surface King, uh, Corps. This, this, this program has a massive impact on reconstructing Nigerian sovereignty to think itself as one and to enable the spirit and keep the impulse of nationalism in, in place. To facilitate such tendencies, youths are mandated to be posted to any place in Nigeria. This includes the rural space. This is the event Afolayan works on as the story progresses between the trial. Constantly, Afolayan for Grand Araro Mire, the village, as its place to be studied, a place of essence. The movement of the character show the intersection of the two spaces, post-colonial Lagos and the post-colonial rural space of Africa, where the community surface camp of the protagonist is located. And understanding the film develops the knowledge of urbanity as Lagos, where the and understanding the film develops is the knowledge of urbanity in Lagos as the place where they live, where the characters live, and where they have schooled. They have no knowledge about the rural space and its cultural history and speciality. Unlike Lagos, which is highly cosmopolitan. Post-colonial Aramere is not characterized with such ethno multiplicity. Afro-Lion's geopolitics is not only from the cultural history of Aramere, but also the location of NYC camp outside the perimeter of Lagos. This implies an obligatory mobility to Aramere for the three urban characters. In reality, NYC camps are usually located from urban scene, urban, urban areas, a move that was orchestrated to include rural spaces in development conversation. Okay, so um, um, I will just round up this paragraph. I'm sorry. So, so yeah, we are presented with a case where rural matters, why it is studied, and why the history that undergirds its exam must be known and factor into relationship. The professor become yeah, there was a professor the the character made in the office, and the professor becomes a useful apparatus apparatus through which we can we are educated about the Arara Mayor as professor approaches the self and brings out the book. The professor represents the institution of knowledge production who can talk at length with certain pedigree authority because of the academic achievement and rich deposit of knowledge about Nigerian speciality. The film, as its cultural theme, wants us to think seriously about the rest and its history as he recounts the mythology and cultural history of the village to the uh, to the, uh, Sola, who is also an urban character, who was also one the protagonist moving from the urban space. But Solas, Solas' dismissive attitude in the professor of, of, process, professor's office demonstrates a person who is less interested in such a history nor a place. Sola directs more attention on the heavy gift, which the professor further affirms that they are cultural, not diabolical. The professor also encourages his perspective that shows that artifacts are not culturally to be sold. The essence of the knowledge of place with the professor's offers is also the geopolitics of the film on face as Iron Man's speciality accrues more significance in the film and for the lives of the and for the lives of the urban characters moving into the rural space. So I'm just going to move on to the to the concluding remark as I have one argument to make, but there is no time to to make it. So I'm just going to read the summary. Maybe the, you can get the angle of my uh, argument more clear, uh, clear clearly, more clearly. Um, uh, so I started this paper by considering the tenure of cultural scholarship, which places urbanity at the forefront of uh, readings 
in contemporary literary and cultural scholarship in Nigeria, I consider uh, the canonical text, uh, Nigerian video films edited by uh, Jonathan Haynes as producing this tone, which foregrounds the place of urbanity in true rurality, uh, uh, which foregrounds the place of urbanity, even though rurality continues to feature robustly on the troop that guides old Nollywood and new Nollywood tradition. I noticed the film produces a similar trend, but complicates the notion of rurality for us. To an extent, I have argued that geopolitics, uh, Geopolitics in three, I've argued the, the geopolitics of the film in three dimensions. The first dimension is to examine the place of scholarship in the readings of representative practice in Nigerian films as on urbanity and rurality. The second angle looks at how the film generates more attention on the knowledge of place by foregrounding apparatus of knowledge in the field of history and uh, theory to recenter rural space as a necessary discourse uh, for, emba of, of, for embarkation. The third dimension is the obligatory restitution with complicated contemplates the rural space as a place to be honored, to be restituted, to be studied, and to be known by urban figures. An opposition in this direction, an opposition, an opposite action may result in adverse tension as the film signifies. In a way, if we're going to become part of a new tradition of films that focalize the rural space in a complex, complex way, which is not immediately reducible to the exotic and the cultural alone. It produces a consciousness of speciality that does not think the rural as an afterthought. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Elijah. That was wonderful. Uh, we now have about 14 minutes for questions. And so uh, we can open up to the audience. Panelists, if you have questions for one another, um, that's obviously more than welcome. Uh, are there folks who would like to jump in and ask a question? And just as a reminder, if you'd like to put your question in the chat or speak it aloud, uh, we're a small enough group that if you'd like to raise your hand or even just unmute, that would work. That would work great. While folks are gathering together their questions, something that I was excited to ask all three of you as I was thinking about your papers and conversation with one another was um, to ask you to talk about the relationship between movement and collective survival. I was really struck by Hannah, your invitation to think about uh, pivoting away from ideas of repair and individualism. And so, and each of your papers uh, thought about movement between rural spaces. Um, in the case of your paper, Lisa, movement between urban and rural in the case of your paper, Olajide, and Hannah, in the case of your paper, thinking about uh, what the city as a model gets us for thinking about incoherence or instability in a, a range of different kinds of spatial contexts. And so with the way that each of you are thinking about movement, I wanted to ask how movement as a focus rather than a specific spatial type an urban type or rural type might get us new ways of thinking about collective survival beyond repair. Hmm. Well, I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, certainly, um, uh, the ability to move around um, on the landscape, while it's immediately um, re-limited, right, and restricted um, uh, by um, white um, white people in, in, in the United States during uh, Reconstruction, it's the essential difference, right? It's the essential difference between before before and after emancipation. Um, but but uh, so and the and the movement the and the ability to move at will. Um, but also perhaps the ability to stay, which I'm, which I'm getting more and more interested in. It's like the sort of the, the power in staying put. Um, but that power in staying put in rural areas, it seems to me that I'm looking at, um, is absolutely dependent upon the escape valve with the city, right? The escape, you know, the ability to go to DC, um, to go to Richmond, to go to Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia and come back. So there's it's this almost this, and I and I'm sort of struggling for a metaphor. Is it a satellite relationship? Is it is it? it but does one thing have to be the the tiny moon and the other <laughs> the big sun, um, or is it more of a? Um, do I need a different a different kind of metaphor? They're, they're certainly in in relation with each other and they depend on each other. And I was also struck during Hannah's talk. I was found myself wondering, you know, and I feel this too. My my, my entire first book was about urban sites. Um, that 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 
the possibility, why did Hannah put it so beautifully, the endless possibilities for remaking in an urban setting. Um, and I, I but but does, does that then mean that, 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 that the urban setting is required for remaking? And also just the notion of forward movement, um, I think we anticipate, we, we associate with actual movement. So absent the actual movement in the, in the, in the case of deciding to stay put and to, to stay in place, what does that mean for growth or development or identity formation um, in a rural context? But it does seem inextricably tied um, to the urban to the urban context. I don't know if that answers your question, but okay. that's I, I suppose there's different forms of movement, isn't there? It's not just we're talking about people on the move, but what are people putting into motion? So what are those? Yeah. Yeah. Um, women dyeing cloths putting into motion by their joint collective movement um, so I'm interested in you know in body language even in in, in, in how authors are representing movement in their texts mm. aesthetically even if there aren't characters who are kind of you know making a journey these are quite explicitly making a journey mm. um, I suppose I'm interested in yeah movement as a possibility when spaces become uh, hostile or um, destroyed. So, if the, the church building wasn't there, if what 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 do you do when you can't um, stay where you are? And the sort of female network I was talking about in in the second text, actually in the first text, they also survive because of um, Fanta's network of um, uh, religious community so they actually stay with other Muslim families all along the way because of her um, her network um, so they're on the move and protected physically because of him but um, they have roofs over their heads because of her religious community so um, it's the intangible but it's definitely connected with the safe you know physical safety and and the need for um, a roof over one's head yeah Um, so um, I would just um, say that in, in the case of the film I treat, um, which builds on a particular Nigerian historical something, uh, the movement is obligatory because the films uh, uh, present a case of a protagonist moving from the city of Lagos to a Nigerian rural space. Uh, for their NYS scheme. NYS is National Youth uh, Service Course, and it's a compulsory one year uh, community service, and you can be posted anywhere, which means that you, you can be posted to rural. And it's far as in, in fact, it's part of uh, government encouragement for possible rural development. But when you are moving from the city and you are moving to a place which is highly, like Nigeria is a highly heterogeneous space, which means that we have so many ethnic groups and the rural, you can actually move and you might not understand the language, which, which, but you can talk to English or something. And you, the person who is moving to that space might be someone of different cultural orientation. For example, I can be posted to Northern Nigeria. I don't understand most of the languages in Northern Nigeria and I'm a Nigerian. So, which means that I have to, when I'm posted to a rural space in Northern Nigeria, I have to know the culture. I have to uh, get a knowledge of the uh, the place, and um, to before I can my relationship can benefit even the space itself. Because if I don't understand the language, the culture, the special history of the space, it means that my movement can produce an adverse effect on that space. Mm -hmm. And that, that that that's actually what the film presents for us as the protagonist moves from Lagos to the rural space. Their movement is inimical. It doesn't produce a good, but it produces fortune. It shows the, 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 the film presents an, a case of people who've moved into a rest space and doesn't know the history of that place, doesn't know the culture, and they are not interested in culture, but find a good cultural uh, something like economic, something that could fetch them money. So they, they, they find this statue and they take the statue from the rest space and they take it to Lagos. And they, they, con, they, they now contract the production of the city to another cover in Lagos and they begin selling this thing. I, it, and, and it produces a kind of fortune for them. But at, as the film progresses, they begin to have some kind of uh, 
misfortune in their life because they don't understand the history of the statue itself. So, because the statue in itself as a mythology that once you have it within you, you can have seven good years of fortune and you can, the, the fortune, the, the other positive of fortune is misfortune. You are going to have seven good years of misfortune as well. So when they, when they have this first seven years of fortune, they were in luxury, they were in everything. And later when the misfortune follows, they begin to try to know what is wrong with their life. They have to return that statue to the original, its original space, which is the rural space. So, uh, so the, the film actually is caution, cautioning us to know that the rural space is not a, a, a place for us to just transgress or to move into, to exploit for our personal economic gain or cultural gain, or maybe aesthetic gain as well. Maybe you just want to present the statue as a decor in your home, but you have to relate with it and know the history, dive, dive, dig, dive, dig deeper into its history before you can take anything or you can interact with the people or you can interact with the space. I hope I make any sense at all. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I so appreciate how both your paper and Lisa's are thinking about really specific productions of rural knowledge, of thinking about the rural as maybe a category that gets uh, oversimplified in thinking about urbanist discourse where the city is very specific and complex and the rural is undifferentiated. And the way that both of you are differentiating rural spaces and thinking about the rural as a composite of specific kinds of place-based knowledge is something that is important that I'm, I'm really happy to have in the room. Uh, other folks with questions, we have a couple, couple minutes. Uh, if there are some questions that folks in the audience have, uh, yeah, Jason. Yes, thank you very much to all three speakers. Um, the question jumps off from Lisa's really, I think, important remark about um, public space. And the question is about publicness and how we should, and how, how that comes into the work that you're doing on these specific spaces. And also how should we establish, you know, what is public space? I mean, of course you said Lisa that you know, cities of course give greater anonymity. And then one question will be about sort of universality, uh, who can enter? I mean, is that a canonical public space, something that everybody can enter? And also does it have to have a particular sort of level of quality or something like that. In other words, it's somewhere where stuff happens. Um, and I'm speaking from the point of view of doing public transport research, which is uh, often an urban public space that's been thought of as having not many kind of qualities. In other words, it's, it's just mundane or boring or empty. Um, so yeah, thinking about public space in any way and, and opening up that. But I, I was just wondering about these questions, universality and then kind of quality and how they come into it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a really interesting um, question given in, in the time period, right? Because they were they were public, um, but they were but, but they also had a degree of, of, of they had to be protected, right? So they were both out there and sort of proclaiming liberty or you know proclaiming ownership on the landscape, but they were always subject to assault um, or invasion. Um, so and 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 that's a really you know, that's a really interesting question. I'm wondering how I would get at it. Um, there's in terms of being open and universal, these, the, the church space is particularly being open and universal um, to everyone. There's there's something about the the, the way that they move from church to church um, that that so that you so that you have a kind of you know evolving or rotating you know population in these different spaces. Um, but I don't. But I that's something I need to look look more closely for, like the degree to which an outsider or a visitor um, was was. Was, or this is a particular type of public space where they had to know who you were in order to be part of the public. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. That's you've complicated it even more, Jason. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. We probably have time for one additional short question. If there's something else that someone has in mind that they'd like to put into the room. Panelists, if you have questions for one another, that's also a good way to use this time. I have a comment kind of following on from, I think um, all the papers kind of assumed this hierarchy, right, of um, either scholarly or cultural productions or politics prioritize the city. And there are ways that that's reversed or challenged. And I, I'm wondering, I suppose, in those challenges, um, is it still the city that remains this this reference point and and is it that because of its 
it, it's being this access point to, to the global. Does the rural ever get to compete <laughs> at that level? Um, and, and I suppose uh, the idea of public, public space, that's part of the attraction, the kind of proliferation of the public space in, in the city is part of the pull because there are more markers of whatever it might give you access to. But I'm wondering about as, as access to the global. Um, so, so that would require um, a, a knitting together of, of, of transatlantic um, and, and pre-enslavement um, uh, time periods, right? And um, there, there was evidence well into Reconstruction and beyond of um, uh, in, uh, in, in interventions in the landscape made by enslaved laborers, including um, in the early 18th century that came directly from West Africa. So that there is a continuum of that, but it's but it's 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 often inside the landscape. The historical archaeology is actually often the route to finding that connection to the global and the transatlantic. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other opportunity in, in the work I'm doing is is theological, um, because churches were so um, uh, uh, influential. And because the, 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 the I looked at the theology as a as a potential for a national or even an international um, network that might mm -hmm. that might um, emerge. I think that's so interesting. Mapped onto then other global networks. So in Cote d'Ivoire, you know, after the economic crash, all these rural young people who'd moved to the city with amazing job prospects wanted to come home, but their farms were being worked, or their parents' farms were being worked on by immigrants oh, <laughs> who'd been who'd been invited in because there were wow. there was a, you know, there was a mass exodus to the city. So the position wow. of the city in people's um, ambitions shifted yeah. with global economic um, you know shifts. So, and really quickly, yeah. one of the things I found when I just when I researched the Shanktown's book is that a, a number of African Americans did go to the city and the Freedmen's Bureau, which was the the um, government organization established to um, try to aid and, and, um, and support emancipated um, uh, people, um, they routinely tried to shove them back to the country right. because there was a huge demand for labor in the country. And often what shantytowns represent is the refusal to be shoved back to the, to the country. So there, there's that tension about, about people who want to be mobile and don't want to go back to the farm, but then, but then less attention paid to the folks who decide to stay put. Um, yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's, there's, yeah, that's a great, great term, right there's a great term in uh, French, rurbain, which is uh, those people who are r rural, but urban, yeah. rurbain, the, the ones who are shoved in between. Oh, we term. put that in the chat. I have, I just did, yeah, oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Save the chat. Yeah. This is probably a, a perfect generative note for us to conclude on. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists for their wonderful papers and for this wonderful discussion. And I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of the conference over the next couple of days. Thanks, everyone.